Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cindy Arnson, the director of the Latin American program at the Wilson Center. Delighted to be joining with my colleague, Anders Beal, program associate of the Latin American program who has lived for several years in Chile, um, follows the country closely. I'm also grateful to the co-sponsor of today's event, the Instituto de Asuntos Públicos at the Universidad de Chile, uh, here represented uh, by Robert Funk. Um, Chileans went to the polls yesterday in a closely watched and consequential election for Chile's future, election for president, for uh, the lower house, and for half of the Senate. The two leading candidates in the polls, um, ultra conservative Jose Antonio Cast and former student leader leftist Gabriel Boric indeed came in first yesterday, Cast with about 28% of the vote, Boric with about 26%. The two of them will head into a runoff on December 19th. And I think it's notable that together, both candidates only achieved a little over half of the votes cast in yesterday's election, meaning that the next few weeks will be marked by a scramble for the votes that went to the other candidates who did not move into the runoff. Um, the visions of Kast and Boric could not be uh, more starkly in contrast between a free market law and order candidate embodied by Kast and uh, Boric, the former student leader, um, resolved to forgive student debt to address the issues that came out in the protest movements in 2019, known as the estallido social, the social explosion. Um, the congressional elections also saw uh, the triumph of people who were independents um, and also representatives of brand new parties. So there's indeed a lot to discuss. I'm delighted to welcome Robert Funk, um, as I mentioned, of the Universidad uh, de Chile. He is an assistant professor of political science at the Public Affairs Institute. Also, uh, Jennifer Pribble is an associate professor of political science and global studies at University of Richmond. She has written widely on Chile. And John Bartlett is the correspondent um, for The Guardian, uh, who is also based um, in Santiago. So um, we will have opening presentations, followed by a few questions from me and Anders. The uh, audience is more than welcome to um, include comments or questions um, in the chat, and we will get to as many of them as the hour allo uh, allows. So Robert, please go ahead. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, Cindy and Anders and, and the fellow panelists. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen here. Just a few um, <clears throat> initial comments, I guess, before we get into the, we get into the, uh, conversation. One of the interesting things is, uh, if, where, where were we going into this election? If you look at government approval, I think it's really interesting. How, first, you see, this is, this is basically the Pineda government, is the jump in government disapproval after, even before, slightly before the protests, but certainly after the protests. And what this suggests is that any idea that Sebastian Sitzel, the government's chosen heir, would do especially well in this election was always going to be a, a long shot, right? I mean, for a while we thought that was the case, but it would have been extraordinary that the, that the representative of a government that was this unpopular with the problems that it faced with protests, with um, pandemic, with, and with a particularly bad political response to the protest was going to be able to uh, go on to the second round and even possibly win. If you look at the polls going into the election, um, what you see is really a, a quite extraordinary stability, not much change except in one area, which is uh, the collapse of Sicho towards the end of uh, September, which was then made up, which is the, the, the sort of turquoise line there, which was then made up by uh, the rise of Kast, uh, the green, the light green line. Everybody else more or less stayed the same. We do see some movement of, of, of Parisi at the end, which is of course, uh, the, the big, one of the big surprises of this election. But what this tells us is that basically it's not that Cast did particularly well, it's that basically there is a certain base of the right-wing vote 
uh, that was divided in two, and that then when Sitchell didn't do so well in some debates and some other issues came up, that vote went back to its natural place, which is on the right. Uh, and so it's hard to see there, on one hand, how much room caste will have to grow. Another interesting point, this is the result in terms of votes, not in terms of percentages of the election. And what we see is that caste got about 1,900,000 votes. And um, that's, if you look at the referendum for the, con the constitutional referendum about a year and a year and a half ago, they, the, the, the reject vote got 1,600,000 votes. Uh, and then the approval side got 5 million some odd votes. If you add up all the other votes that are not cast here, that's roughly 5 million votes. So uh, again, we don't see much movement in the Chilean electorate. We don't see much necessarily growth on the side of José Antonio Cast. Um, you also don't see Gabriel Boric really moving much beyond the base of, of the left. Um, and you see this, this kind of dispersion, which, and then the big question is going to be, as Cindy kind of suggested, to what degree those votes, this mad scramble that Cindy said, um, uh, to what degree those votes will e each of the two leading candidates will get. Uh, just a, very, a few very quick points. I, I don't, I would think my seven minutes is a very short period of time. Of course, the big surprise was Parisi. We can talk about him in the, uh, in the discussion. Uh, he, I think but Parisi, among other things, uh, is a sign of something that, uh, um, that Jenny's going to talk about more, which is the, the collapse of the party system. In fact, the top two and the top three candidates are not from the traditional political parties. Uh, and this is really something that's new in Chile and we need to look at. And I think this goes way back to not only the protests of 2019, but even before that. There's a lot of talk in Chile about whether we're in post-October Chile. In other words, whether the the, 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 the anger and also the enthusiasm and the excitement of the protests of October and November of 2019 have given way to more realism, have given way to exhaustion, that Chileans are tired of protest and violence. Um, I think there's a lot to analyze there. I think there's some of that is true. I think particularly on the left, there were a lot of interpretations from the protest that this meant that Chile was now, you know, sort of woke, that we, was, that, that we wanted a, a a huge, uh, that there was a major call for, for the kinds of things that the left had been calling for for a long time, including a new constitution. And I think a lot of that is questionable. I think the protests were more about institutional crisis, rejection and mistrust than they were about things like economic inequality. We can talk about that later on. Um, one of, and just to, to sum up, to leave time for everyone else, the big question now is going to be what happens to the uh, how the other two candidates respond and will they moderate? And to be honest, even though it's logical that they should moderate in order to, uh, to go beyond their base and attract more, more, uh, more votes, it's very difficult for both of them to moderate. Boric has the communists on one side in, in his coalition. And if Boric moves too far to the center, uh, he's going to have a problem within his coalition. Cast, on the other hand, uh, I think is not even is not even um, sort of constitutionally made up to moderate. In fact, if you look at other right wing nationalist populists like Bolsonaro and Trump, their whole their whole persona is made up of not moderation and actually kind of provoking the left into uh, becoming more radical, and that gives them more space. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see, on the one hand, their electoral needs conflicting with the reality of both of these candidacies. I will leave that there uh, and leave the rest for the conversation. Thanks so much, Robert. Uh, Jenny. Sorry, having a hard time getting my mic unmuted. There we go. Um, so I am going to follow pretty nicely there on Robert. I want to start by thanking Cindy and Anders for the invitation to participate in this panel and to the Wilson Center for hosting it, uh, about this very important and consequential election that we are, uh, watching unfold in Chile. So with limited time today, I'm going to try and make one central argument, which is that I think the way to think about these results that we saw yesterday is 
through the lens of party system collapse. I think what we can see very clearly is that Chile's party system is in disarray. We see that, as Robert pointed out, through the collapse of the traditional center left and center right coalitions. I think we also see it, however, in the remarkable performance by Parisi carrying uh, just about the same share of the vote as the traditional center right candidate. And this is a clearly a protest vote. This candidate is not living in Chile, uh, ran sort of a, a media campaign without any real connection to the country and the issues whatsoever. We see it also in the fact that the two leading contenders carry only about a quarter of the electorate each. And then finally, I think it's really important to point out how low electoral participation and turnout was yesterday, lower than the 2017 election. And to me, that also points to this growing disaffection, the inability of parties to reach out to voters, to mobilize voters, and to organize voters. And so why is this the lens through which I think we should see this? I think it's because what, what happens in elections when parties are in disarray or when parties are weak is that the political arena lacks structure. As political scientists, we know that parties give organization to issues. They help direct voters. They help voters make sense of their preferences, order their preferences, and link their preferences in some way to an electoral option. And in the absence of meaningful organized parties, strong parties that are rooted in society, that have the ability to bring people out and vote, we tend to see very volatile elections. And I think that's what we saw yesterday. Part of why this election was so unpredictable and part of why I think going forward into the second round, there's a lot of unpredictability as well. We've known that Chile's parties are weak and losing support for some time. We know that was a central component of the 2019 protests. Here I have some graphs showing us that in the region, Chileans are have some of the lowest lever levels of trust in political parties and some of the lowest levels of belief that leaders or the political class understand them and know them. And what I wanna argue is that while this system has collapsed, nothing has emerged in its place. So we see new left parties and we see this new kind of right party emerge around caste, but neither of these options are rooted in society with meaningful organizations that can reliably bring people out to vote. I think what is very interesting about the results yesterday, and here I have some maps that I cannot take credit for um, that show us the results across the territory of Chile, is that this disaffection from political parties and from the political system more generally is strong across Chile, but it seems to be stronger in the regions outside of the metropolitan region. So whereas I think there's been some realignment of the political parties in Santiago with the left being able to start to capture voters, root itself, that has not happened in the rest of the territory. And of note is how terribly Boric performed in the north of the Chile, uh, in the north of Chile and how incredibly well Parisi performed in the north of Chile. Uh, we see Cass performing well in the center south, that's perhaps less surprising. But what I think this suggests is that while this new right that is emerging is ideologically coherent, I think, I think it has a strong anti-democratic tilt. Um, it may not be rooted in society, but it seems to be able to carry its traditional voters in the center and south of the country. Whereas this new left, and I think this is something interesting, the left vision that Boric put forward, which in many ways is a kind of 21st century vision of the left with not just redistributive issues, but important post-material, socio-cultural issues, gay rights, environmental justice, and other issues, that does not seem to have been appealing to the traditional base of support of the left in the north of Chile. And I think that shows the lack of party building and connection to voters at the base. Um, I think this regional divide is important and I and here I'm gonna push back a little against Robert. I actually think the path to victory is harder for Boric. I think there's less space for him to grow if we look at the performance of Parisi and Sichel. Um, I think Boric's 
Boric's path to victory is by bringing new voters in. He must convince new voters to turn out if he wants to win in the second round. I don't think there's enough room for him in the center to bring voters in to win. I'm just going to finally close with this, which is that the Boric program, I think, I think part of the campaign is that the campaign moved away from the distributive issues that might have uh, helped Boric and toward the issues of violence, security, and stability. And I think a cast victory, uh, which may ride that wave of, of frustration with perceived instability, will not undo the very real redistributive demands that exists in Chile and that were present in the Estadillo Social. And in that, I, I, I disagree a little bit with Robert. I think the Estadillo was about discontent with the political class, the political system, but I do think there was a strong component that was about inequality. We can look at this graph. We can see that Chile is one of the countries where the perception of inequality being unjust is highest. And this, this table on the bottom shows us this is perceptions of whether or not you'll have access to healthcare by income quintile. And we see tremendous gaps between the poorest Chileans as to whether or not they believe they'll have access to healthcare. So in closing, I think that um, I see an easier path to victory for CAS than Boric. That doesn't mean it's a done deal. I like to believe elections matter and that there's always possibility to expand the electorate. The turnout was very disappointing yesterday. And I think that's where Boric needs to turn if he wants to win in the second round. I think if though CAS does find that path to victory, I think there are significant ramifications for Chile. In particular, I worry about this, how this interacts with the rewriting of the constitution. I think a CAS victory would shape the work of the constitution, what might be the content of that document. I think it would likely in turn, and as a result of CAS using the bully pulpit, perhaps against the process, shape public support for the constituent process and the documents that that constituent process ultimately produces. And I worry that this could halt Chile's need to progress toward re-establishing trust in political institutions and moving political competition back into an institutionalized form of political competition rather than extra extra institutions institutional protest and other forms of competition. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Jenny, thanks. Um, before turning to uh, John Bartlett, I'd like to remind the audience that if you have questions, please um, submit them via Twitter uh, to our Twitter account at LATAMPROG, L-A-T-A-M-P-R-O-G. Um, not via the chat that we do not have live. So please do uh, interact with the speakers, with all of us uh, via at LATAMPROG. Um, John, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Cindy. And thanks, Anders, as well, for the, uh, for the invitation. It's great, to, uh, it's great to be in touch and put a, a face to a name with Robert and, uh, and Jenny as well. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a freelance correspondent here in Chile. I write for The Guardian, uh, The Washington Post, uh, New York Times, uh, several other, other places as well. So I've had very little time over the last uh, seven, 10 days uh, to kind of put my, put my thoughts in order. Uh, I actually filed my last piece this morning about five minutes before this went live. So uh, I don't have any slides to share, but I have a few observations uh, from yesterday when I was uh, Kind of moving between polling stations here in Santiago. Uh, one of the things that, you know, one of the caveats to that obviously is that uh, I was doing quite a lot of television and radio work yesterday. So I was staying uh, largely around my home in Providencia, uh, which is one of the sort of upper middle class areas of Santiago. So my, my, uh, my perspectives in that regard um, are certainly, uh, certainly along the lines of Santiago not being Chile, but also Providencia not being uh, Santi like representative of Santiago as well. So uh, one of the things we did see yesterday were huge lines outside polling stations, which was um, a cause for optimism, I'd say. I think a lot of people were, uh, were quite enthusiastic about the, uh, the potential turnout, which obviously turned out not to be uh, uh, quite, what we'd, uh, quite what we'd hoped for with 47% uh, of the election, as Jenny says, lower than the, uh, the previous presidential election. Uh, there and also, you know, considerably lower than the uh, the plebiscite last year, which was obviously far more um, 
a far easier election, I think, to, to turn people out for. I think there were two very clear projects on offer, um, arguably the were this time as well, but uh, I think there's uh, it's probably more reasons to vote against candidates than for them this time around. And I think that's what we're going to see uh, moving into the second round as well. Um, in terms of the sort of the sort of sociological trends that we're seeing as well, and the arguments that uh, that people are uh, that people are bringing forward, I think that we've got a process of sort of reactions and counter reactions at the moment. Uh, certainly, speaking to people here on the street, it's quite interesting to to see how. Um, this narrative that the last 30 years of the transition have been kind of overwhelmingly uh, apathetic, needlessly delicate. Uh, in some ways, people are saying that it's been a negative process over the last 30 years. Um, I think that simplifying things too much in that regard has, um, has certainly pushed people to, uh, to, to, to vote uh, for Cast this time around. And I think that uh, one of the other things we've seen with the, the result yesterday is that the, the other narrative there, which is, again, a, a sort of counter reaction, is that the last two years have been, have been positive for Chile. That's certainly not the case for everybody. I think that there are legitimate concerns, uh, sometimes overblown with regard to public safety, public order, uh, and the violence that affects kind of small parts of Santiago and, uh, and around the country. So I think that we're always going to see quite a divisive election where the, uh, the themes, that, um, themes that decided it ended up being um, you know, kind of well, migration, obviously, sort of surged the top of the agenda uh, in the month before, uh, before the vote as well. And, um, and, and yeah, I think that I, <laughs> I kind of thought that this, uh, this might be uh, a Boric win in the first round, not outright, of course, because that doesn't really happen in Chile, but I thought that this was going to be, um, the, the Boric is uh, sort of, as, as Robert used the word, that um, I think a lot of people, uh, well, a lot of people don't like it, but this sort of woke idea of politics, this sort of progressive trend um, that, that Chile has undoubtedly been on over the last two years, this sort of in, uh, inclusive language is very easy, it's a, it's a strong foil for Cass to push back against, I think his narrative is, is perfectly suited to, to face off against a Boric style candidate. Um, so I think that, that that trend obviously hasn't seeped into the regions, it hasn't uh, managed to galvanise the support that the, the protest movement once did. Um, perhaps that's Boric himself. I'm not sure if this is more of an indictment of, uh, of Boric and his capacity to lead the country as a as a 35 year old and in alliance with the Communist Party, uh, as much as it is a um, you know a vote in favour of, of Jose Antonio Cast. Um, and I think like what what Jenny was saying about the the left and the north, the traditional left vote uh, that we've seen uh, largely desert Boric um, in terms of the working class vote in the in the north of the country. Uh, Chile's no longer um, is no no longer the, the, the country that Allende uh, took power in. Uh, talking about factories and workers and uh, and general redistributions, uh, and I think the another thing that, that Jenny said there, which I thought was really interesting, is the uh, the uh, the redistribution narratives that Boric pushed uh, a lot early on, and then realised that perhaps that wasn't what he uh, wasn't the angle he should have been taking. And I think that what's en what's ended up happening was that Boric lost control of his own narrative, uh, not just in the national press but in the international media as well. Um, he was, you know, he ended up being portrayed as something that ultimately I don't think he was at the start of the campaign. Um, and then finally, just as a, as a comment looking ahead, I'm also I'm also worried for the constitutional process. Um, I think that. Um, I think that it's it's been a it's been a positive process so far. I think it was a necessary process for Chile to uh, to undertake uh, and at least to get underway. Uh, there's clearly been some kind of campaign towards towards undermining its progress, both from the from the government in terms of the funds that's released for the uh, for the process to take place, uh, but also from the media here in Chile. And I think that people had hugely high expectations, which were never going to be matched. Uh, were by by the actual kind of output of the of the constitutional assembly. Um, so I do worry. I do worry for that. And I think that what we might end up seeing there is if, if under a caste presidency, uh, we may end up with, uh, the, again, another reaction within the Constitutional Assembly, which is to try and force through a constitution that is so, uh, so you know, so such a polar opposite uh, of, uh, of what a caste government would represent, that I think it's going to be very difficult for caste to, for caste to govern and also for the next government to, to follow on after, after him, should he be elected.
So those are some observations. Um, I can I can make more uh, later on uh, as and when prompted. But uh, but yeah, it's been a it's been a fascinating uh, couple of days, and certainly I think it was it was unexpected, um, particularly with in terms of Franco Parisi's vote in the north. So I think that's a really interesting uh, area to look into, and uh, I'm sure Jenny can can talk more about the the sort of uh, the collapse of kind of the. Uh, well, the disaffection with uh, traditional po uh, political parties, which I think has been a huge factor here. Great. Um, thanks for those three excellent opening uh, presentations. Anders, over to you for the first question. Yeah, so uh, we've mentioned that you know, now the, now the uh, opportunity for both candidates is to, to seek support from uh, the moderate candidates, from CHL, from Parisi, from uh, Proboste. How, how do you see Cass and Bork appealing to those more center uh, moderate voters and what particular issues are there that the candidates might use to to get support? Climate change has been a big issue in Chile uh, domestically for foreign policy purposes. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity there um, for the economy as well. So I'm just uh, wondering what topics and, and how do how do these candidates get to a more moderate platform and less polarization within, within the discussion? Who'd like to go first? I think, uh, Jenny, you had mentioned that um, that uh, Boric was, would have the hardest time uh, benefiting from the votes of the other candidates and would have to turn out um, more people to, to show up. Do you want to take a first crack at that question? Yeah, so I think so I think that while we might reliably be able to assume that votes for Sitchell will translate to cast, uh, and some of the votes for Provoste will translate to Boric, I don't think we can get, we can count on all of them. Uh, I think the Parisi vote is a huge question mark. First of all, will they turn out to vote? Because it's largely a protest vote. I do not think Parisi voters want to vote for anyone who they perceive as a member of the political establishment and political class. The, and I was looking at some exit poll information this morning, Parisi voters rated their number one issue were pensions and their number two issue was security. So it very much matters how these candidates stimulate issues and how they try to sort of and they are the absence of meaningful party organizations, I think, really hurt. So that is what leads me to believe that Boric has to appeal to people who didn't turn out to vote. Um, and I think that's why his job is so difficult, because his job is to convince people who stayed home, who think that nothing ever changes, who are frustrated with the system, that it's worth showing up, that change can happen. And in a sense, to do that, he needs to push probably redistributive issues. But at the same time, he needs to appeal to the center to bring the Provoste votes in. So I think he has to walk a tightrope. That is very difficult. I think Cass, by contrast, if he's able to keep the focus on issues of security, you know, the threat of the Communist Party, terrorism, I think that he uh, can probably pull a good share of the Sitchell voters in, maybe some of the Parisi voters, and he's less pulled in two different directions. And that's why I feel like it's a harder path for Boric. Also, historically, the one who wins the largest share of the vote tends to go on to win the runoff. So that also speaks well for cast. But historically, Robert, you don't... You you don't win the country without Santiago. So there's a, there's a counterbalance there. But I actually agree with you, uh, Jenny. If you look at the numbers, you know, just add that, just do the math. Say half, Barisi got about 900,000 votes. Uh, Sitchell got about 900,000 votes. It's, as you say, absolutely unpredictable what a Barisi voter will do. But say half of those go to Gast. It's not unreasonable. I think it's more, more likely to go to Gast than to Borich, but we don't know, but let's say. Say half of the Sitio voters go to Gust. It, might, it could even be more than that, but say half. That's a million, almost a million more votes for Gust. Just that makes it, you know, um, makes the path easier for Gust than for Borage. And add to that other aspects, which, are, you know, which here my colleagues have touched on. Um, I, you know, I think Borage, in a way, uh, and the Frente Amplio have gone down a path which is not dissimilar to what 
even the Udi used to be here for some, you know, this what we what we call testimonial parties, right? Where they they want to represent a, cent, a certain sector and they want to project a certain message, um, which in which is a kind of reivindication of the of, 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 of the left and of a left which they think was in the past too moderate, uh, and therefore they're going to reclaim not only the language. And, but also the symbolism, and it's to some degrees the policies, although that's a bit of an exaggeration, but at least language and symbolism of the old left. So you see Boric last night, when everybody understood that really what he had to do was moderate, go out and give a speech where he talks about compañeros and compañeras, and he lifts his, his, his fist in the air, and you look out at the public and there's not a single Chilean flag, but there's flags that weren't, although they looked like, because they were black and white, they looked like the flags of the Mir, which is a far left group of the 1960s. You see rainbow flags. You see one Chilean flag with a lot of bullet holes in it, right? So again, it's it, in terms of just symbolism and just language, you see that they're kind of, uh, there's a kind of atavic, atavistic uh, desire to reclaim something of, of the past which comes from their criticism of what the center left did over the last 30 years. The problem with that, of course, is that as long as you continue with that, with that criticism, how do you then attract the millions of voters who supported that center left? And how do you attract the parties that were part of that center left, which is what he needs to do now. Now he actually got kind of lucky because the socialist party very quickly said, we have to all be against caste and we're gonna go over to Boric and we're gonna support him. The Christian Democratic Party, not so fast. They're going to have a meeting and a consultation and they're going to decide the way that Christian Democrats tend to do. So, um, you know, what, what I'm seeing is that Boric is not really, uh, it's very hard for him to leave behind that, that narrative and that, that epic that he's worked so hard to build. Um, and that's why just that, plus the math, makes me think, as Jenny said, that uh, Cast has an easier path. Uh, John, do you want to add to that or uh, differ from what the past two have said? Uh, I, I won't differ. I don't feel I'm qualified to, to offer anything quite, uh, quite that different. But I think it's interesting, before we move on too much from Parisi, uh, the, the, the breakdown of his vote that I saw this morning from uh, Paul Sosio Dadano. Uh, looking at the kind of demographic that voted in his favor, they were largely sort of uh, uh, lower, sort of lower middle class men, young men from outside Santiago. And I think that those were the people, and obviously a lot of those were in the north as well, but those were the people that no one was really speaking to. Like, I think that was a disaffected voter. Uh, as Jenny says there, I'm not sure that I'm not sure they're going to turn out in the second round in, in particularly huge numbers. I think it is almost a lost vote, that sort of 12%, the 13% that went to him in the first round. Um, but I think that was that's a really that's a really interesting point, and I think that those voters probably are there to be won, um, but perhaps not by someone from from the traditional political class, which is all we have left now. So I think that that's interesting, kind of looking forward. I think that's where the kind of the party system needs to needs to uh, direct itself looking forward in the future. Uh, but also what Robert mentioned there, I think this is maybe a, a slightly longer discussion for maybe a separate question, but the idea of identity uh, that Chile is, uh, that's, that's, I think it's going to be a huge thing in the second round. Um, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the two programs that the candidates have, you can sort of distill them down into this sort of, again, I use the word, but sort of woke, ecologically sensitive, um, kind of politically correct, um, you know, sort of feminist Chile, which is, the opposite of what Cast wants, and that's sort of Boric's program. And I think that when you're looking at that, as as, as Robert says, the protest, um, the protest movement, you you barely ever saw a Chile flag. I mean, in the first couple of weeks, they were it was full of Chile flags, and after that, you had the Buenafoya, the Mapuche flag that's been in use for the last thirty years. Um, you know that kind of replaced it. Then you had this kind of uh, sort of the outline of the Chile flag with all the colour drained out of it, the black and white one. Um, which is uh, an, another kind of you know, repudiation of, of, the, of the sort of the, the 30 years, if not kind of you know, 50, 50 years of uh, uh, the last 50 years in Chile. So I think that that's the that's the really interesting thing that we've got to we've got to look at now. I don't think that particularly particularly favours Boric because I think that you know it's it's, it's uh, very much in Cass' favour to kind of say, well, hold on. 
things haven't been overwhelmingly negative. Things are actually working in Chile. Maybe we need to reform in some way. I don't think Cass is the one to do that, but maybe things need, do need to be reformed in some way. And his, his program says explicitly the opposite of that. But, um, but I think we've got a far, a far more profound conversation to be had here in terms of identity uh, than, than we've had so far. So yeah, maybe that's something to, to, for the other, the other panelists to comment on, but I think that's going to be important in the second round. Great, thanks. Um, I have a, a question about the contrast between the results of the election for the Constitutional Assembly um, and the results uh, that we saw yesterday. The reading of the, the voting for the, the members of the, of the Constitutional Assembly were that they, these were new faces. Again, I think the, uh, the trend that, that Jenny and others have pointed out, you know, um, people repudiating, turning their backs on the traditional parties, also turning their backs on uh, the traditional parties um, of the right. So a lot of new faces um, and a sense that the Assembly overall um, is is a leftist grouping or or uh, to the left of the of the political center. So I guess my question is twofold. Number one, how does that um, comport with the results yesterday? I mean, if you can explain that contrast, um, and then to pick up on a question from uh, Joel Velasco of the United Health Group, um, which is um, uh, what will be the impact? of the second round of the winner of the presidential election on the proceedings of the Constitutional uh, Convention? And is it possible um, that uh, should cast be the, um, the winner as, all, as I think most of you are predicting, um, would he campaign uh, against approval of the constitution that is ultimately put to a referendum um, once the, uh, the constitution and once the convention completes its work? So, uh, kind of a, a two-part question explaining the differences between the results of the assembly of the constituent assembly election, um, but also what would a cast victory um, mean for the uh, the assembly itself? Who wants to go? I'll go, I'll go with on with a with the second half of the question because it also speaks to something I, I made a little note when when Jenny was speaking about her concern about how the a cast victory would, would interact with the constitutional convention. I share that concern. I think there's no question cast will, will try to use the bully pulpit to, if not undermine it, maybe perhaps mold public opinion. And, and uh, but there's, a, there's, a second, there's another side to that coin, which is how the constitutional convention will try to undermine cast. There is a stipulation in the constitutional amendment, which sets up the current process, which states that if the political system is, uh, if the new constitution makes a major change or a I think the word is substantial change to the political regime. In other words, if it shifts from presidentialism to par a parliamentary system or a semi-parliamentary system, that doesn't even say that, it just as a substantial change that then it is, they are allowed to call for new elections. Which makes sense, right? If you're going to get rid of the president, presidential system, you want to get rid of the president. So that makes sense. I wonder to what degree this constitutional convention with the current makeup facing a presidency uh, led by Jose Antonio Cast will be more tempted to use that uh, stipulation to try to remove Cast. That would be a major institutional crisis. Um, on both sides, because I don't know how Gus would react, would he turn to the armed forces, you know, it would be a mess. They all, there's also not a lot of time. Recall that the Constitutional Convention is only working, supposedly, unless they ask for an extension, until July of 2022, and then we have a referendum in August or September of 2022. Um, and the new president only comes into office in March of 2022, so there's only about, what, four or five months of overlap. Um, and then of course, which the, my colleagues have mentioned here, say none of that happens and then we get a new constitution and Gast is then in charge of implementing the new constitution. So there's, there are many questions there, but to answer Joel Velasco's question, you know, um, I think the relationship there is going to be key and it's hard to see how it could be anything other than tense. Yeah, Jenny or John, do you wanna take that I can jump in and then turn it over to John. So I think um, 
It does. At first glance, it seems uh, nearly impossible or completely wild that you would go from electing the most representative body in the history of Chile. Uh, if we think about the demographics of who is in the convention, the gender parity, the reserved seats for indigenous, so many aspects of, of that convention to um, the likelihood of the far right sort of nostalgic for the military dictatorship, perhaps carrying the presidency. I think though, with the election of the convention, one thing that happened was of course, who carried the day were the independents, right? So the, the independent lists performed better than any of the established party lists. I mean, it was a clear sign of what was coming on the horizon. And I think what we don't know, what we didn't know, and what we still don't know is what is inside of that black box of the independent lists. And I think what, what happens with the independents is that they are truly independent. They live with the contradictions of what all voters have. And that is that we have a set of preferences that often are hard to fit together, right? We want a better pension, but we're worried about inflation. We want guaranteed access to healthcare, but we're concerned about violence in our neighborhoods. And so the independents sort of don't make us choose. They don't make us pick. And so then what you have is a set of, um, representatives in the sense of the convention or voters in the sense of the Parisi voters who are maybe one issue is taking the lead one day and another issue might take the lead another day. So I don't think it is these two outcomes are as incompatible as they might first seem. I think they both point to the collapse of the traditional party system and the fact that the new parties have not built organizations that allow themselves to reliably structure political competition. And that's where I think, I don't read last night's results so much that Boric's position on any number of issues is hugely unpopular. I think he was unable to sell his position. I think he doesn't have a partisan organization that is present in the territory, that is meaningful in the lives of Chileans, and that is able to organize and mobilize voters and structure their decision-making process. So the center left collapsed and what has emerged hasn't yet replaced it organizationally. And, and I think that that helps us understand that, this, that disconnect. In terms of how the, the convention might be affected, I agree that the convention could change what they include in the document. I expect that a cast presidency would involve sort of undermining the process. I think even before cast, the outcome of this was highly uncertain. Nearly 50% of Chileans did not turn out to vote in the plebiscite about rewriting their constitution. That's nearly 50% of the population that we do not know where they stand on the issue of the constitution. And then we had lower turnout in the election of the convention. So here again, I think all of this just points to how important it is that we take seriously the disaffection, the collapse of the party system, because it's worth working its way into all of these issues that, that we are talking about. Yeah, I, I don't want to talk too long about this. Just wanted to, to just uh, follow up there with what uh, Jenny alluded to with the, the change of the rules for that election, uh, which is obviously kind of, you know, why it looked different on the uh, on the face of it. And we had all these independents, I think 43% of the candidates who put themselves forward were, were independents. Um, so I think that what that speaks to is a sort of overwhelming will to want to democratize the, the process here in Chile to include these voices from outside the convention. I think, uh, sorry, from outside the sort of traditional uh, political class. Um, and they were overwhelmingly elected. I think independence and, and sort of, you know, sort of relative leftists, I think sort of swept the, swept the convention. Um, if you look at what's happened then more recently with the, on, the, on the issue of independence, and since, the, since 1989, I think there've only ever been 10 uh, deputies who've been elected as, as independents. There's been one senator who's been elected twice. And then yesterday we saw Fabiola Campillay, the woman from, from the, the, the sort of far peripheral south of Santiago get elected. Uh, as an independent, which I think was a really interesting case. I think she was able to galvanize a lot of support among people who uh, kind of saw her name on the ballot paper and kind of, you know, felt some kind of identity with her, uh, with her, um, her struggle. So I think that that, I'm not sure what you'd say it was a turning point, although there does, there is, uh, 
legislation moving very very slowly through congress at the moment looking to to make the the rules that we we had the uh, constitutional convention elections held under uh, the norm rather than going back to this uh, this current system where the barriers to, to participation for independence are incredibly high um so i think that that's a really interesting conversation to, to have and i think that it kind of you know uh, adds sort of you know layers on top what, on top of what jenny's saying about the uh uh, about the, the the collapse of the party system, and then I think on the second point, just a very a very um, sort of specific point is that you know Cast makes this this point over and over again, um, emphasising that he is a Democrat. You know that this is you know he is he is overwhelmingly Democratic. He wants to uh, he wants to kind of uh, make that point over and over again, and I think that would be severely tested if uh, if the convention tried to go against him in any way, let alone trying to remove him as president under a new set of rules. So I think that's what we're going to see there. And, and then just in in answer to what um, to, to if that does happen, I think it would be fairly chaotic and not it's obviously not too far along on the horizon. So, yeah, I think that that's uh, certainly a, a worry. And I think that, you know, a, a president who supports the work of the convention would probably have been ideal. It's looking less likely now, of course. But um, but but yeah, I think that was uh, that could perhaps have been a bigger issue in this, uh, in this in this election than I think it actually was in the end. Another uh, question here. In, in, in Cass' uh, closing speech last night, he highlighted the elections as a choice between uh, liberty or, or, or communism. And there's been a lot of discussion over the extremes on both sides uh, of this election. Um, but Cass in particular has been very outspoken of his support of uh, the former dictator of Chile, General Augusto Pinochet, um, saying that if he were alive today, he, he would vote for Cass. And so clearly Cass is an admirer of the free market economic policies of the former uh, military junta. Uh, but in light of the protests of 2019, what, what will you know, a potential caste government really pretend, uh, portend for Chile's governability? Does having such a world view mean uh, that there could be likely greater division uh, that grows amongst Chileans? Could this be uh, an influential factor in turnout, particularly among uh, uh, young people and, and those that might share a more uh, a worldview more aligned with, with what Boric is uh, proposing? So one of the extraordinary things about Gast is that even though he claims to be an admirer, admirer well, there's a claim to be, I think we should take him at his word, that he's an admirer of, of Pinochet and the dictatorship, he doesn't really uh, offer a very coherent economic uh, plan. Um, you would think that a candidate of the right would, uh, that would be their strong point. And in fact, he doesn't really have much of an economic team. He doesn't have much of an economic proposal other than lowering taxes. He said that again last night and, and reducing the size of the state. So given the place that we're in, not just because of the demands of the 2019 protests, but the demands of the, the fiscal demands that the, that the economic effects of the protests have had and the economic effects of the pandemic have had without even thinking about what future fiscal demands might emerge from uh, from the Constitutional Convention, which are likely to be quite uh, high. So, you know, there's several international media reports have, have, have suggested that both Gas and Boric's economic policies are, are pretty unrealistic, um, with the difference that Boric at least pays lip service to fiscal responsibility, pays lip, he has, he's got a very good team of economic advisors, he's got you know, uh, technocrats, the technocrats that he spent 10 years criticizing, but anyways, he's got technocrats on his team and academics and, and economists. Gas doesn't have any of that. Now, I suspect that between the first and second round, some people from the government parties will start to, to now head over there and, and bolster his, uh, his policy side. But for the time being, it's quite surprising that he doesn't offer much uh, aside from rhetoric in that regard. Yes, I think um, whoever wins is going to have a hard time with governability. So I, I, I think uh, both a cast presidency and a Boric presidency will struggle with governability for different reasons. Uh, but I think on the cast side, I'm very convinced that the demands for redistribution aren't going to go away. 
Uh, and once Cass wins, the ability to, to frame his government and his performance in terms of law and order will decline over time. I mean, he can, he can make claims about that, but he won't be able to only ride that as president of Chile. And I think if you look at, for example, the responses to COVID, Chile ruled by a right-wing president, but with the boldest, broadest, most generous cash transfer response in the region by far. And what you can see there is that I mean, in a sense, it was it, the center-left parties in the parliament that pushed Piñera to be to to be more expansive in that policy. But I think it's also the role of protests in the street. And I think that uh, if Cast ignores those demands, and maybe no matter what, he's going to face significant um, resistance in the form of street protests. I think that will become a clear pattern of Chilean politics. And, uh, and so I, I expect governability to be, would be quite different, difficult for him if he does indeed win the election. I think for Boric, it will be difficult as well, but for a different set of reasons. Yeah, the, the governability question is very interesting, uh, particularly if you looked at the last debate uh, last Monday, which seems a, a very long time ago now, uh, there was a question about governability and the answers were underwhelming all round. At that point, we still had well seven candidates in the race, six of them in Chile. Uh, and the answers all were largely people repeating the word governability without offering any kind of kind of promises and, and, and solutions there. Um, I think that well, I, I haven't had time to properly digest the uh, the congressional uh, results from yesterday. But I think on either side, as Jenny says, is going to be a, a considerable um, issue there in terms of um, in, in terms of you know governing uh, this sort of post 2019 Chile post uh, post transition Chile if that's what we're if that's what we're going to call it although well, that's quite a that's quite a big big claim maybe not one that I should be making but um, I think on the uh, on the issue that uh, that Jenny raises there in terms of the the protests a lot of people have been asking about the sort of longevity of the movement in terms of the uh, you know the the large sort of you know sort of mass gatherings in in Santiago and across the country and how that's going to keep mobilizing I think that's a big question a big question moving forward and I can't see under a cast presidency, how that's going to how that's going to go away because the redistribution issue will not be solved unless, as Robert says, uh, some kind of um, you know economic pro economic advisor comes into the cast team and actually expands that kind of set of policies. Um, but I think that yeah, in, in the short term, we're going to see we're going to see more protests under a cast presidency if he does get elected, um, because I don't think that you know the, it, over the last thirty years there haven't been the sort of institutional channels to make those kind of demands anyway, and so protests have in many cases been the way that people have voiced their voiced their demands, uh, you know, also through cabildos and, and latterly kind of through these sort of town hall style meetings, which ultimately don't really lead anywhere, but have led to to, to Boric's. Uh, uh, program for governance, which I think is another interesting sort of facet of this. But um, but yeah, I think without the institutional channels to respond to these demands and without any kind of will from Jose Antonio Cast, then I think that you're just going to keep seeing this same sort of, kind of churning wave of protest, which ultimately would would benefit him anyway, because he can keep painting this as an overwhelmingly sort of violent and unruly movement. So I think you're in a, we're in a bit of a sort of chicken and egg situation there with regard to the violence and the protests anyway. And under cast, I think that it would just be a, a quite a comfortable cycle and, and rhythm for him to settle into to to carry on denouncing the violence and then doing nothing about the the, the, the demand at its core. So I think that that's what we're going to keep seeing. But again, it's uh, obviously a long way to go before we get to that situation. Yeah, it's a pretty grim vision. I'd like to turn to um, someone in our audience, Javiera Garcia, uh, a reporter for BN Americas. Um, it's a question directed to Jennifer, but it could easily be directed to all of you because it has to do with the core concerns um, of the voters for the, sm the, the smaller vote getters. Parisi uh, said that, uh, Parisi voters said that, uh, you know, one of their main concerns was pensions. Um, do we know anything more about the concerns of the people who backed uh, Provost and, and Seychelles? Uh, I don't know that we know. I have hypotheses about what might have been some of, some of the motivating factors. Um, and I this morning I was so pressed for time, I really haven't been able to look at through some of the uh, the results by district, and we still don't really have a sense of maybe gendered differences. Um, but 
I suspect that the Sichel vote was a vote uh, in search of a modern right in Chile, right? A sort of aspirational vote that recognizes that Chile will always have a strong right component to the ideological spectrum, but wishing that, that you could pull that right vote um, into a space where perhaps on sociocultural issues, uh, it would be more in line with kind of 21st century views. Um, and I think there's probably an element of that vote that worries about uh, some of the autocratic, perhaps, suggestions of, of the caste program. Um, the Provoste vote, I suspect, is the traditional center left vote that said, look, we made little by little, we made progress. We did things when we were the concertacion. It's not that nothing changed between 1990 and 2019, right? We reformed the healthcare system, we reformed the pension system inside of tremendous constraints. We tried to build something that was a little bit better and we put democracy at the front. And I think that there's a vote there that's proud of that. And that says, wait, we don't have to apologize for what we did because we did some good things as well. Um, so I don't know how that translates into the second round, but that's my suspicion. I wanna leave time for the others. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Robert, any uh, any sense of yeah. what was behind no, those? I think that those are good descriptions. I think uh, Provoste tried to get some, obtain support from what's left of the Concertacion, which as Jenny says, are people who are willing to recognize or still recognize and take ownership of what, to, what what occurred over the last 30 years. One of the extraordinary things, and I've been meaning to write about this, but someday maybe I will, is basically the suicide of the Concertacion. The Concertacion didn't disappear. The Concertacion decided to disappear, and that happened largely under Michel Bachelet's watch with, with student protests, where Bachelet and part of the Concertacion basically said, you guys are right, we've been terrible, uh, and we're therefore we're going to reform education and we're going to have a new constitution. And, and Bachelet was right in many ways because she saw where things were going and tried to channel that before. And unfortunately, Pineda stopped it. But, but behind that, there was also this kind of guilt of not having gone further faster. Uh, and it's normal for the next generation to question the, the parents' generation, say you didn't do enough. It's not normal for the parents' generation to say, you're right. Uh, here's, a, here's an education ministry, now go play. And that's basically what happened uh, under Michelle Bachelet too. Yeah, I think that's spot on what Robert's saying there. And I think the generational uh, divide is, is something that can't be, can't be made enough of. I think that's what we've, what we've seen over the last two years, but over the last 30 as well. So I think that that's really important. And that's exactly what the, the kind of progressive vote is. I think it's the kind of the, the, the sort of, again, as I said at the very beginning, the kind of reaction to this idea that like, the, the transition was a failure. For many people, it hasn't been. For an overwhelming number of people, I think it hasn't been. I think that that was an uncomfortable sort of narrative that was born from the protests. Um, and then on the right, I think that there's, uh, there's an interesting element here, which is Evopoli, which is this sort of, um, you know, kind of center right kind of, it was the sort of progressive liberal right um, that I think Sicho um, was was keen to sort of appropriate a lot of that vote, a lot of the the kind of the the sort of the personal narrative around him at the very start of the campaign was about the fact, you know, kind of personal things, the fact that he'd been hitchhiking around that in America, the fact that he wasn't from an affluent background, that he had tattoos, that he had this kind of, you know, a very different image to what you're used to on the right. And that was made probably too much of, I think, early on. Um, and I think that he lost a lot of support there because it, it didn't ever really kind of, you know, compute with what we'd seen from a former Piñera minister and former banker as well. So I think that that was interesting. But the Evopoli question is another one I think that we need to look at, you know, kind of in a bit more detail. Because I'm, I think I'm right in saying that the Evopoli leader has already, he already said before the first round that he would support caste or they would support caste in the second, which is completely at odds with what, uh, with what Evopoli um, stood for. You know, it was actually born to do as this sort of, um, to put this in sort of a UK context, as a sort of a David Cameron esque sort of you know kind of new right that sort of came about and and tried to try to take like a new sector of the vote, which I can't remember if it was Robert or Jenny said is always going to be here in Chile. I mean, it's a it's a, a largely conservative or moderate society, and I think that you know there are 
elements that are center left as well and always going to be but that's uh, you know that is never going to change in chile so i think that that project was probably um one that was that could have been successful may still be but i think that the situal the situal vote there needs to decide whether they are on the liberal or the or the right leaning side of, of that of that particular project so that's going to be interesting in the second round i don't see many situal voters defecting to to, to boric at all but um, whether they can bring themselves to vote for caste is another question. I think that's the same question applies for, for Proboste as well. Um, we're just about at time, but we're going to have allow one last question. Uh, Andres, please uh, go ahead and, and ask the question. I'll ask the speakers to be really concise in their answers. Andres. Yeah, briefly, uh, immigration or, or, or migration throughout Latin America has been a huge issue. Uh, Chile in particular has seen a, a large wave of folks coming from Haiti, Obviously, Venezuela has, has made a large portion of, of uh, migrants coming to Chile. How will both candidates uh, address migration? We've seen Cass talk about this building a ditch and, and Boric uh, as well as, has kind of been unable to address migration in a way uh, that voters might seem to be an effective candidate to do. So what are your views on just the issue of migration, uh, immigration in Chile? Well, you know, it's really interesting um, that just bef just prior to the protest of 2019, there was a SEP poll published, which is one of the more reputable polls in Chile. And they always ask, what are the main concerns? What are your main concerns? The top, you know, the top things you worry about. And it's always crime, healthcare, and so on. Right before the 2019 protests, suddenly immigration zoomed to the top of the list. Right after the 2019 protests or the following set poll, immigration was at the bottom of the list. And that says to me that immigration amongst just like, like crime and other things really is really sub is very much subject to agenda setting, right? So when the media talks about this all the time, then everybody's worried about it. And when suddenly the media is talking about protests in Plaza Italia, nobody's worried about immigration anymore. And immigration kind of disappeared from the, from the debate for a long time. Uh, Gast brought it back. And then it again really came to the fore about a month or two ago when we had this very tragic situation in the north of the country where a bunch of protesters set on fire the belongings of a group of illegal immigrants that were camped out in a, in a town square in, a, in the north of Chile. Uh, if I wanted to be conspiratorial, I'd say that was basically part of the plan all along. Uh, and then immigration came to the top of the list and Cast ran with it. So um, yeah, I mean, like everywhere else in the world, immigration is, is, is a challenge and, and we're seeing that has capacity to really sink, sink governments. So um, we'll see how Gust handle it. That'll be an interesting thing. If Gust is unable to do something about it, um, how that will affect the possible Gust government. And of course he will be unable to do something about it. I think, um... I uh, just to add to what what Robert has said, I think that immigration is the possible bridge between Parisi voters and caste, the most direct possible bridge. Uh, when I saw the remarkable performance in the north, the first thing uh, that I thought was, is this is this immigration? Right. Because if we think about the conflicts over immigration, they are much more pronounced in the north, around the mining industry, Antofagasta in particular, and in Antofagasta, Parisi won the entire region, right? He was the leading candidate in the entire region. So uh, I think that if CAST is looking for a bridge, that might be the bridge to Parisi voters because pensions, health, housing, the other issues they're worried about, that won't be the bridge. Security and immigration would be the bridge. Uh, whereas Boric is going to need, if he wants to try to get those people out, to appeal on the basis of health, housing, uh, pensions. But again, I'm, I'm not clear if they'll turn out, but that's what I can add in addition to what Robert says, which I think are, are great points. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm basically just going to agree with both of you. But I think in the in the first uh, in first instance there with Robert, I think that it was it's a really interesting, a really interesting dynamic that, that before the 2019 protests, migration, I mean, you know, a million people had, had arrived in Chile and not very long at all. And I think it's almost a sort of unexplored uh, sort of part of the of the SDU as well, because I think that, you know, people who thought that the sort of welfare provisions were lacking in Chile 
they, they were going to be far more stretched with with all these people arriving in the country and without the institutional capacity to 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 take them in in terms of the like the, the laws that existed in the country they still don't properly exist to, to kind of you know kind of take all these people in but also in terms of the housing deficit that Chile has there are so many things that uh, that are just not capable of, of taking in these in, taking in these people and that was one of the big blunders i think pinera made when he invited venezuelans uh, to the country without ever really thinking about what that would mean should they arrive uh, and then secondly um i was i was actually in iquique when that when that all kicked off that that whole that whole sort of protest uh, uh thing that happened and i was really interested to see that it was quite a sort of quite a sort of broad tr transversal sort of movement i mean there were people there were kind of floating voters there were people marching i talked to lots of different people some of them were marching um having traditionally voted for the left uh, there were people there who were basically were had, had a single issue and nobody really to to, to vote for because boric wasn't really talking about it no one was really talking about migration at that at that sort of certain point in time and while i was there cast appeared out of nowhere and did this sort of whistle stop tour up to colchane the place on the on the bolivian border where he wants to build these ditches and he always refers to the kind of cheers and and, and things that apparently he got when he when he mentioned building ditches in this one uh, already very conservative sort of town it's one of the five i think that, that voted against writing a new constitution you know a year ago so i think that that's really interesting as well how they these people were looking for a candidate cast appeared took all those votes in and came up with a hard line sort of proposal this idea of creating a body in the image of ice as well the the us uh, sort of idea to to seek out actively seek out uh, illegal migrants in the country and i think that you know, I think that people were people have voted or will continue to vote on on that issue if it's if they if it's what they deem to have affected them most. So I think that that was a that was a, a shrewd move on Cass' part, and I don't think he ever really needed to to kind of you know substantiate any of those policies that he came up with. Uh, uh, you know, on the sort of almost in the spare of the moment. Great. I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Jenny, Robert, and John. Uh, this video will be on our website, uh, hopefully later today. I'd like to ask Robert and Jenny if they would be willing to share the PowerPoints that they presented at the beginning so we can add those to the website. And as always, none of these events would take place without uh, the, the support of Oscar Cruz, Beatriz Garcia Nice, Tracy Fitzgerald, and thanks especially to my colleague Anders Beal for uh, co-moderating this session. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.